Hi, everybody. Welcome to Everybody Votes podcast. We are here with Sam Donaldson, who was the ABC News White House correspondent. He covered Ronald Reagan. He covered Bill Clinton. And he covered all of the presidents in between. Oh, don't forget Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter, of course. And so there's a famous story where Sam had a question for Jimmy Carter. And his press secretary simply walked over to Jimmy Carter's office and asked the question for you. Well, Jody Powell was his great press secretary. Uh, they, he was part of the triumvirate that brought Carter to the presidency as his advisors. And one day I went in the office, I'd forgotten what the subject was, and I said, Jody, what's the president going to do about X? Jody said, well, you know, I don't know, but here, I'll, I'll find out. He jumped up, he left the room, he came back in about three minutes, and he said he's going to do this. And I thought, what service? <laughs> who else have I known as a press secretary to a president who can get up at any given moment, go see that person, get the answer to the question, and tell me? I mean, that was really, really something that great. was good access. And do you think there's anyone, if you ask that question to someone around Trump, that they would be able to go and do that to him? No. No. No, Donald Trump is his own press secretary. You name any position, really position in government, and that's what he wants to do himself. He doesn't want to listen to people unless they're praising him. Right. Well, you know, one people. of the interesting things is we could make the same analogy. Um, Chris Matthews, the great MSNBC correspondent, said one of the problems that Jimmy Carter had was that he was a small businessman and he wanted to do everything himself. So we're seeing a trend. If you ran a business, you expect to do everything yourself. And we're seeing it with Carter and now we're seeing it with Trump. Well, Carter was an engineer and engineers have a plan and, and they engineer. don't have a lot of time for small talk. Right. He wasn't a great national politician. Right. He'd come in a room and he'd want to talk to you about a very important subject and he'd listen to your views too and he'd tell you what he thought about it but he, how's the wife how are the kids where have you been lately he didn't have time for that well, one of the things that's very interesting hedrick smith who wrote a great book called the power game actually attributes the changing of the presidency to jimmy carter and that he was a weak president and so other forces filled the void would you agree with that well he was weak in the sense of the grandeur of the office yeah. for the first three weeks of his presidency he went out a couple of times, private dinners. Right. And he stopped at the stop lights that were red. Yeah. This is the presidential cavalcade and didn't have the flag of the presidency of the United States on the, on the vehicle. And people came to him and said, Mr. President, people expect you to be a little better than we are. Right. They expect was, you to be grand. This, the same <clears throat> criticism for carrying his own luggage on the campaign trail. It was like... Well, that was know, a device. I yeah. saw one time that his bag was empty. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> it may not have been empty all the time yeah. over his shoulder. Yeah. Uh, he was a man of the people, let's he face was. it. He was. He made no pretenses to be a grand person. But he had a plan, and he wanted to put it into effect. He just wasn't effective but, but, but in doing it. When you look at a president like Jimmy Carter, and maybe even when you look at Trump, and certainly when you look at John Kennedy, they represent two things. They represent themselves and they represent the office of the president. And I think John Kennedy did a good job of doing both. I think Jimmy Carter did a good job of, and he certainly didn't embarrass anyone about being president. I'm not sure about the current executive. How do you think he's doing in representing the office and in representing himself? Oh, I'm sure I can give you my opinion. Okay. Is there a word that's worse than terrible? Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> Uh, this man cares nothing about anything but himself, his grandeur. Right. He, he must be one of the most frightened individuals I've ever met. Frightened in the sense he's not sure of himself, he's not sure of his own worth, and so he compensates by saying he's the greatest of everything, he's going to make the best deal, he's going to do it all himself. All the time trembling, I think, inwardly that we're going to find out that he can't do it. But, but in a way, you have to give him a lot of credit because even though he is maybe scared on the inside, he looks brave. He is tweeting. He is Instagramming. He is doing Facebook. I mean, the guy has brought himself into the modern age. It's quite a feat when you look at it that he's kept up with the technology and he's used it to simply ignore the White House press corps and go right over their heads straight to the people. Do you think Ronald Reagan could have done that? Well, he did to a large extent, but why is it credit to pretend you're brave when well, you're not? He's I mean, back at least down. he's trying. He's back down on yeah. every major initiative that he promised his base right. when right. he was running for election in 2016. And they haven't noticed. He's back down to Kim Jong-un, mm. a nobody, yeah. until this man brought him to the national stage, right. made him somebody. Kim and, had never been to Moscow right. until now. Right. He'd never had these meetings with Xi from China until now. He'd never had the ability to thumb his nose at us until now. But do you think we could make the case and we could say, if Donald Trump had better advisors, they would have prevented those types He's of mistakes? He's not going to listen to his yeah. advisors. Yeah. 
Jim, Jim Mattis, Jesse. who was the defense secretary until finally, <laughs> the last year, had enough. Right. And left. And Trump had had enough of him mm. because Mattis was a tough guy, a former general. He knew the business. He was a moderate person who blocked Trump's most evil prescriptions. At one point, you'll recall, Trump tweeted one morning, I'm going to throw all the gays out of the military. Right. Remember that? We do. <laughs> we we very remember much. that, right? And Mattis was from South Boston, Matt was a Matt tough guy. Mattis said, we're not going to do that until we have the yeah. proper, all of that in put it away. Right. Now, he doesn't have anything around, around him like that anymore. No. Cohen, uh, a financial advisor who knew the markets, right. knew Wall Street, he's gone. 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 There are 40 people in this administration who are already gone, who were put by Trump in important positions. Forty. Forty. But, never but, seen that. but let's move on to say, okay, Trump is, everything that Trump has said is going to say, is going to say today is going to be true. We know that about him. If you are advising the Democratic presidential field, where would you go with that? I mean, it looks like to me we're simply going to be against Trump. That really no, isn't no. a strategy. Like Eleanor Roosevelt told us, you win at politics by saying what you are for. What do you think these Democratic presidential candidates, are you hearing any of them talking about what they're for? Well, yes, I, I've heard. I mean, Elizabeth Warren. Yes. I mean, Bernie Sanders, of course. They shout what they're for. Right. And they're for a lot of things that I like. Yes. Oh, I would love to have children have free education. Absolutely. I, I would love to yeah. have everyone health care that meaningful, not just me because I can afford it. Right. But to get there, you have to have the majority of the American people on side. You have to have a high, I think, by the time we were in the 40s, certainly, mm -hmm. most Americans understood that racial discrimination was an evil. Right. It took us till 1964 to pass legislation doing away with the jury segregation because you had to amass the majority of Americans. And Ms. Uh, Warren and uh, Mr. Sanders right. Right. somehow think you just do it because it's a good thing. So you're saying they're good on ideas, but they don't understand the process? The process is important. Nancy right. Pelosi understood the process. Right. She grew up under her father's table right. with big Tommy D'Alessandro, the last big city mayor, mayor. of Baltimore. Right. Had great. an eighth grade education, but ran that city. And and he was also a congressman before he, he was, was a mayor. He was, and he taught his children politics right. and how to get things done. So I trust and hope when you they know, winnow the a, field, the Democrats yeah. will come up with a nominee right. who has the right ideas to move this country forward and certainly to get well, you know, the values enough, back. We do know a few things about Democratic presidents. One, they tend to be young. And two, they tend to be left-handed. So John Kennedy was 43. Barack Obama was 46. Um, Bill Clinton was 47. Pete Buttigieg is uh, 39 and left-handed. I'm not just saying. Not going to make it this time. Uh, you don't not think this so? this time. Why? Well, I think there's not enough coalition that he can amass who will say, hey, we're in the era where it's fine who you love. Right. This is great. And right. this guy has it. We're getting there. Yes. And we're going to get there quickly, I think. We're we going got, to get we've, there it's exponentially. Amazing where we've gotten. And Pete is someone you're going to watch for the future. Right. But you don't think, you don't think lightning can strike? You don't think there might be a oh, third party? Oh, lightning can, can always strike. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but let's it never hope for really lightning. does. Yeah. No one has ever really but, drafted. But, but in 1992, don't you think that if Ross Perot had not been a candidate, there would have been no Bill Clinton? I mean, that's sort of a fact, right? Well, that's not right? true. No? You thought it, and I thought it at the time. Yes. But all of the data from that election show that although he got 19% of mm -hmm. the popular vote, mm -hmm. not a single electoral vote, that vote would have gone in a distributive way that still would have put Clinton in the White Interesting, House. Interesting, because I thought that maybe the Libertarians would put up a candidate, drain off enough votes that the Democrat would run up the middle. But you're saying that's not what happened and in 92. Look, look, look this smart guy named Bloomberg, Michael Bloomberg. Yeah. yeah. Three times now he's looked at the possibility of running as an independent, mm -hmm. and three times he's come to the right decision, I can't make it, I can't do it, right. I can't put together in the states the people to work, I can't get on the ballots quickly enough, I do not, I have the money, and I have friends who will give me all the money I need, right. it won't work. Well, but I think that's a very interesting point that you bring up, though, because I've registered a lot of voters, and I watch them, and I look at, you know, we don't really study the data, we just talk to them when they're registering. The number one choice of pres of, of uh, a presidential a, a party is declined to state. Nobody. And so you're wondering, do they have something to coalesce around? They don't right now. Decline to state or independent doesn't really exist. There's no infrastructure. So you're making a good point. Can that change in the next couple of presidential elections? Because it could have a tremendous difference. Make a well, tremendous I'm a difference. centrist. You asked me just a few moments ago. Yeah. I don't know the name. 
Yeah. Biden's ahead as a centrist, but what's going to happen in the next few months, I can't tell you. But would you call, so let's look back at the presidents. Franklin Roosevelt was not really a centrist, right? He was pretty much to the left. Do you agree? Well, I agree to the extent that in Pittsburgh, though, about three weeks before the election, mm -hmm. he said one of his promises was to balance the budget. Right. Which was, of course, right. a promise of his predecessor. Right. But it was his brain trust said, we've got to do it because that's the Right. They got to the office and discovered balancing the budget would send us right over the cliff. And he began spending money and with coming right. up with programs. So, yeah, um, I agree that people ought to be in the center. Right. But and was Harry Truman in the center, do you think? Oh, yeah. Harry Truman Harry was, was a, right down the middle. No, he was a Pendergrass politician. Right. Um, a hack, a lot of people thought, right. until he rose to greatness. Right. <laughs> With the a, David McCullough book a, as much as anything yeah. in some ways. But, but also then Eisenhower, I would say, was very much a centrist, right? Yeah, I think so. You know, but, but I think Kennedy was a little bit left. But Eisenhower didn't really have a great philosophy, except yeah. basically he was a conservative. But right. he was not a politician in the sense of the partisan politics of our country. He right. was a politician, and that's why he was able to put together a coalition on that front to invade Europe. But he also had really good ideas. When he stood up in front of the country and said, we are going to build the interstate highway system, no one knew what that was, and it was not, no, there was no way to finance it. No one had a clue, yet he said, we're going to do it, and he did it. Well, that's he signed of, on to an idea. He signed on to an idea. But I don't know that it was his idea. But he was wise enough to say it was something the country right. needed. Right. And he couldn't have done it without the two Democratic leaders in Congress, yes. Rayburn and Johnson. And, and you talked about before that you started your career under the Kennedy administration. I mean, when you look at the actual numbers, Kennedy passed almost no legislation. All of it was pretty True. much bottled up. Yet he redefined the presidency in a way, right? With the media, with television, starting with the debates. I mean, do you think Trump in some ways has redefined the presidency with social media? Oh, he redefined it in his terms. Yeah. I do not believe, though, it's a redefinition that's going to last. I trust right. and hope right. that I'm right about that. Yes. If we don't return to a more normal set of values that this country has always espoused, that has made us the light of the world, right. we're lost. We're lost. And would you, would you, if you look at Richard Nixon, who I think, I mean, well, Lyndon Johnson obviously was the most, I believe, the most impactful president of the last half of the 20th century. In what direction, though? Well, I mean, he did things. He got, he got Medicare through. He certainly understood the system. He got the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. I mean, he certainly got through a lot of programs, and he never gave up. He had to go back three times and open up the Social Security Act to get uh, Medicare through. He did it, right? I mean, so it was impactful. He did it as a leader who knew how to bring together politicians and get votes. And uh, you should give him credit. I give him credit for that. Right. But the last speech before the breaking of the Southern filibuster, right. that particular vote, which meant the bill was going to pass, right. came from a Republican, Everett McKinley Dirksen. Mm. And he quoted Victor Hugo, nothing is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. Right. Those ideas that you just mentioned, the time had come and Johnson was able then to push him over. So you were saying done it. He would, if, if people didn't support the idea, it would not have worked. If it had I been, think that's correct. Right. Interesting. I mean, today, and, if, if Elizabeth Warren becomes president and says we're going to have free education and you're going to pay for it and all of that, hey, I'm willing to pay for it. Right. But I'm willing to is, pay for it. If, yeah. If there's not the time... That idea has not come to fruition with the majority of American people. Right. She's not going but, to be but able to do it. But let's just backtrack a little bit, because if I look at what's happened in my life, I think the most impactful things for me have been Ogrefeld, the gay marriage decision. And I would say Citizens United. You know, I can't say Brown v. Board of Education because I wasn't born yet. So one thing that you have to wonder is when did the legislative system stop working and that we have all these major decisions coming out of the ju judiciary rather than coming out of the Congress. I mean, do you think that's true? I think the system began going to pot with yes. Vietnam. With Vietnam. Meaning the system that I grew up in as a very young man and it all looked good and people uh, were friendly to each other even though they disagreed and people understood that if you got the vote, you got to win and you had to obey the law and all of that. Uh, Vietnam has continued to put its heavy weight on this country and on our feeling about ourselves and our feeling about 
how we should proceed. And do you think the fact that, that Pete Buttigieg is running for president is a, is a war veteran, it, that's unusual. We have not seen a, a commander in chief who has actually served since I believe Al Gore as vice president in 1992. Do you think that has weight Well, the commander in chief would have been George Herbert Walker Bush, right. number 41. Right. Now, others tried after that, Bob Dole, who'd right. served, but they weren't successful. Right. I wonder if that makes any difference. I guess we're going to find out. I think we need to wrap up. Th Sam, thank you very much. You're going to answer a few questions about Russia. It was great to see you. Pleasure, David. All right. We'll talk Good to luck. you again. Bye-bye.